Amen. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, music team, for leading us and preparing our hearts in worship. And now we have the I would invite you to turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. It's found in the Pew Bible on page 944. Uh, 944. So we continue our look into this wonderful book of Romans penned uh, through the Holy Spirit and the Apostle Paul. I'm going to look at two verses today in our time, verses 26 and 27. And as you're turning there, let me begin by by observing that of all the character traits that one could possess, or all the character traits that our culture holds in high esteem, it appears that weakness is low on the list. In fact, people despise weakness in others. We live in an age where we're supposed to be strong and not weak. I think they have a lot of hashtags out there, whatever, something strong, this strong, bracelets, all about being strong. The weak are often perceived as vulnerable and helpless, and we certainly don't want to be one of those people. <laughs> Whenever you interview for a job, we've been practicing interviews in our house lately. Whenever you interview for a job, they ask you about your strengths, and then they ask you about what? Your weaknesses. I always love those questions. Tell me about your weaknesses. I never know how to answer them. I, I, I say things like, well, I guess if I had any weaknesses that I work a little too hard sometimes. Well, I guess my weakness could be that I just care too much about my job. I, I mean, what are you supposed to say? There's a book that we love called Strength Finders. It's a, kind of a personality test that gives you a little bit of a profile. And in that book, you're told to forget about your weaknesses and, and focus on your strengths. And certainly that is appealing because, you know, your weaknesses are, if you're focused on that, you're better off focusing on your strength and not your weaknesses. Who wants to focus on their weaknesses? Well, the idea that weakness is somehow bad or some kind of liability goes against the clear teaching of Scripture. Have you ever noticed how often the Bible emphasizes that Christ and the gospel come especially to those who are weak? The Old Testament is filled with references to God helping the weak. The psalmist often prays that God would rescue the weak, those who can't help themselves, those who are oppressed, those who are poor, those who are despised, those who are weak. Jesus not only ministered to the weak, but we are reminded that the disciples he chose, to those disciples, he even reminded them. Instead of praying and when they were sleeping, he reminded them that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? Weak. Have you ever thought how often that Paul talks about ministering in weakness and ministering to those who are weak? And Christians being careful not to harm those brothers and sisters who are among them that are weaker? Well, with all this being said, let me ask you the question. Do you ever view yourself as being weak? That's how Paul viewed himself. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I remind you what Paul said. When Paul prayed three times that the Lord would remove this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan, Paul pleaded with the Lord to remove it three times. And the Lord's answer came to him, and you're probably familiar with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, this is what the Lord said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am what? Strong. In our passage today, Paul has a word of encouragement to those of us who know we are weak. He wants to encourage us that God's Spirit will help us in all our weaknesses, and in particular, in our weaknesses in praying. If you came here today and that you feel like you're pretty strong and you're not in need of any assistance or that you feel like your prayer life is, is all together and your spiritual life is all together, then I would just say to hang on a bit longer and be open to the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And with that, let's read just two verses in Romans 8, verses 26 and 27, then we'll ask the Lord to help us. Romans 8, verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts 
knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. A brief prayer, if you'll pray with me. Heavenly Father, I, I acknowledge my weakness before you, Lord, and that I don't know everything there is to know about this text. But I pray that your will would be done, Lord. And I take comfort in the fact the Holy Spirit is our teacher, our comforter, our guide, and he helps us and he intercedes for us. So, Father, by your Spirit, would you plead, please intercede for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Three simple questions to ask of the text. Who are the weak? What is our weakness? And how are we helped? And number two and number three, I already told you the answer to number one. Who are the weak? We are the weak. Look at verse 26. Paul begins by saying, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Now, our passage begins with the word likewise, or depending on your translation, in the same way. And commentators would go back and forth as to what this means. I think it refers back to the groans of creation and of believers for their redemption, their glorification, their final perfection, uh, to be free from corruption of sin and, and bondage of sin. Paul says, in the same way that all creation groans for its redemption because it's under the curse, the same way all God's children groan for their complete redemption, and the same way that the future glory gives us hope in this present suffering, the Holy Spirit is groaning in us and with us and providing comfort and encouragement in our weakness, especially when it comes to praying God's will for our lives and for others. Now, that's a pretty lengthy thesis statement. But Paul says the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And the language that Paul uses suggests that he's including himself in the help of the Spirit naturally. A careful reading and rereading of Scripture resolves a lot of misunderstandings, a lot of misinterpretations. So verse 26, let me remind you, does not say the Spirit helps us in those moments when we are weak. Of course that is true. It says the Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Spirit doesn't remove our weakness any more than the Holy Spirit removes our sufferings. But the Holy Spirit comforts us in our present sufferings and in our weakness. And this is what Paul is driving at. This is what Paul wants to get forth, get through to the believers that he is writing to in Rome so that they would take great consolation and great comfort in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, we don't have moments of weakness. We are weak. Who are the weak? We are the weak. From the most mature Christian like the Apostle Paul to the newborn babe in Christ who is just starting out. We are weak. And the reason I say that is because weakness is synonymous with living in a fallen world in these fallen bodies. Weakness is indicated by these present sufferings that we spoke about last week. The, the trials and the tribulations we go through in this present age. The weakness we all experience in the battle against sin and in the, in the fall of the flesh and, and being ill and, and just getting weaker day by day. So who are the weak? We are the weak. Secondly, what is our weakness? It's like that question at the interview. What is our weakness? Paul gives us an answer. Are we physically weak? Yes. Our bodies are wasting away, whether we admit it or not. I don't like to admit that I'm not as strong as I once was. I'm, I'm getting weaker. I hate to admit that. Are we spiritually weak? Yes, we're spiritually weak. Have you ever tried to battle a besetting sin or something, a trial or a tribulation or a discouragement or some bitterness that's crept into your life? We're weak in doing battle against those things. Even though we are saved and justified through Christ, our situation is one of total dependence on the Lord for life and for breath and for everything. But what kind of weakness is Paul really talking about here in our text? Well, physical weakness is one kind. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, the story of Jesus in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane is a perfect illustration as he's, he's exhorting his disciples to pray and not fall asleep. And yet, what happens every time they cannot pray? They keep falling asleep indicating their weakness. Certainly we're physically weak and getting weaker. But I think Paul has something much more profound and something deeper and more spiritual in mind here. And the text indicates that to us. Verse 26, Likewise the Spirit helps us in, us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. 
I think the weakness Paul has in mind here is a weakness in understanding God's will for our lives and the lives of others that we pray for. It is expressed in the fact that the text says, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought to. And I know that might go against the grain of some of us who believe that we know everything we need to pray for. Have you ever had anybody ask you, as they ask me often, what can I pray for you? How can I pray for you? Do you want to know? That is one question that baffles me. I don't know how to answer that all the time. I struggle to give an answer for that. How can you pray for me? Uh, uh, well, you could pray that I would, uh, you know, pray for my family. But, but generally, how can I pray for you specifically, Pastor? And so I always bore one of Paul's prayers and just give that to them for Colossians 1 or something like that. But, but we do not know how to pray as we ought. And bear with me. James Boyce, the Bible teacher, he has a broadcast called The Bible Study Hour, wrote a little book called, Is Prayer a Problem? Now, assuming in the affirmative that prayer is the problem, Boyce asked the question, why is prayer a problem? Well, let me ask you, is prayer ever a problem for you, knowing what to pray for and how to pray? And what can be done about it? Now, the text is helpful in providing answers. Why is prayer a problem? Answer, because of our weakness. Prayer is a problem because of our weakness. In our weakness, we don't know how to pray as we ought. So, I don't think Paul is alluding to besetting sins in our lives as weaknesses. Of course, those are a hindrance to prayer, no doubt about it. He's rather referring to our human limitations to know and to fully understand the will of God and how to pray accordingly. And this is not a matter of knowing, not knowing how to pray, but what to pray. It's a matter of not knowing what to ask of God. I remember that same James Boyce who was diagnosed with stage, end stage cancer, phenomenal pastor in Pennsylvania, just a wonderful godly man. And he got, you know, and he was talking to his congregation and something to the effect with, I don't know what to pray for. I don't know if you should pray that I would get healed or that I would go to glory. And he kind of was struggling with that whole thing, telling his beloved congregation what to pray in that moment. Well, I want you to be encouraged, brothers and sisters, that the Holy Spirit knows exactly what to pray for you. And regardless if they're the longings of your heart or the articulations of your words, those things that are uttered unto God, those things that you speak to God, are, are taken by the Holy Spirit and brought to the Lord in perfect accordance with the Lord's will. It's a wonderful encouragement. What is God's will for us and others? I've heard people say, you know, well, I, I, I'm glad God didn't answer that prayer. You know, looking back in our life when we prayed for certain things that were just not good for us. I want you to know that God only answers prayers that are good for us. He only answers prayers that are in accordance with His will. He's not going to answer my stupid prayers for things that are going to hurt me. He's going to answer prayers for my life that are good for me. And the assurance of that is the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit, the Son who intercedes, and the Father in perfect accordance. What is God's will for our life and others? Now certainly Paul isn't saying that prayer is the only area where our weakness is on display, but I would say it's one of the primary areas where our weakness is on display. Now you can test that for yourselves if you think that's true. And have you ever been in a situation that it was so grievous and so overwhelming that you didn't know what to pray for in that situation? If you haven't, then just live a little longer. You'll get there. We've all been in those situations. But first of all, we have to admit our weakness, which goes against our sinful pride. Second of all, our minds and bodies are still tainted with sin. So what I'm submitting is that it's absolutely impossible to know the perfect will of God in these situations and in every situation. And, and weakness in prayer is saying that we are totally dependent upon the Lord for everything. That's what prayer is. Prayer is dependence upon the Lord. And we show our dependence by our prayer lives. A lack of prayer shows independence from God. 
When I'm not prayerful, I think in my own strength, or I can resolve my own issues, or whatever, then I am independent of the Spirit in, in God. But Paul is driving us towards dependence here. Many times, brothers and sisters, and you know this if you tried to help another brother or sister in need, that we don't even know our own spiritual needs at every given moment, let alone those around us. The great Apostle Paul, who wrote Colossians 1, Ephesians 3, as well as several other wonderful prayers, himself even admitted his own weakness in prayer. I recently heard a sermon where the pastor was speaking about choosing the disciples early in the Gospels. And, and um, in this one section, he was uh, equating the, the different personalities of the disciples to different personalities that we may have in the congregation. And he alluded to uh, Jesus calling Simon the son of John and changing his name to Cephas, which is Peter. And we know that Peter means the rock. And, you know, some of us are like Peter. We're, we're like a rock. And, you know, we're independent. We're a little impetuous at times. And the point of the sermon was an encounter with Jesus changes our characters. So I listened to the sermon and I thought to myself, okay, Simon would become Peter because of his rock-solid character and the church would be built on him. Now, I rejected all that. But I had to think, how was Peter rock-solid in his faith at the moment Jesus chose him and he was introduced to Jesus? Was it when he denied Jesus three times to a little servant girl? Was it when he went back to fishing after Christ was crucified? When did Jesus exactly be transformed by this, by this encounter? Uh, when would Peter be transformed by this encounter with Jesus? When, when, when did Peter become the rock? It sounds to me like Peter the rock was Peter the weak. So when did he become strong, brothers and sisters? When did he become strong? Let me give you a hint. In Luke 22, verse 31, this is Jesus Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Apart from the intercessory, intercessory prayer of Jesus, Peter was helpless. Peter, the, the, the supposed rock, was helpless against the, the ploys of the devil. Uh, helpless against the flesh. He had confidence in the flesh, but he was no match for Satan or even a few bystanders at the cross. And although he pledged to follow Jesus faithfully to the end, he was blindsided and derailed by his own human weakness. Now, he was bold in proclaiming what he would do, but what he really needed to do was become totally dependent upon the Lord and not himself. And of course we know a difference after the Holy Spirit come and they received power that the disciples and Peter became very bold. But my point is, friends, don't be lulled into dependence upon your own strength to live the Christian life. Don't be fooled into that. Don't be drawn into that because of any natural abilities that you have. Don't be drawn into that because you've just got a propensity to memorize scripture or know theology or you can do certain things or you're faithful in attendance. Don't be lulled into thinking that you can live the Christian life in your own strength. It's very dangerous. We really don't know what we need. We can't discern our own thoughts and intentions, but here's the good news, the Spirit can. We don't know fully God's will and purpose for our lives and those around us, but the Spirit does. Who are the weak? We are. What is our weakness? We don't always know what to ask God. How are we helped? Number three. Let me read the text one more time. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what's in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now we're just going to look at two simple texts this morning, but I hope that they become um, ingrained in your hearts as you go from here and as you struggle in prayer. And I use those words carefully because we are called to struggle in prayer. If you're not struggling in prayer, I wonder if you're truly praying, for it's a struggle. We're laying hold of the promises of God in the Word of God, and we are fighting against our own flesh and the, own, and our, and the world. 
And as Jesus told the disciples, our flesh is weak, but the Spirit is willing. And so, brothers and sisters, we are dependent upon the Holy Spirit. And the line of reasoning in these two texts is a little hard to follow, but a few things are clear. We are weak. Our weakness is manifested in that we don't know how to pray as we should. We don't always know what to pray about. And as we struggle in prayer, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. He prays according to God's will because his mind is known by God. Now, I just, I just rephrase the text. When we put these things together, they make a direct line of communication to the Lord. Be encouraged by this. I know it's hard. For example, you ask somebody to pray in public. I remember the first time someone, a pastor asked me to pray in public at a public service. I was nervous. I, I mean, I, I practiced all night. I was like, seriously. What this text is telling us is that we have a direct line of communication and you don't have to be always concerned about the right words or the right phraseology or the right tone of voice. It's that the Spirit knows your heart as you articulate your heart to God. Be encouraged that the Holy Spirit takes that and He intercedes for you in perfect accordance to God's will. As one commentator says, He rearranges our prayers and He may, he may throw out things that are not with God's will and He interprets them directly towards God's will. That's why we can't fail in our prayer lives. We can't have a defeated prayer life if we would just trust in this text, knowing the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. This is the line of communication. The Spirit prays perfectly for us in our sufferings, and God answers those prayers because they are in line with His will. You see that? He who searches the hearts knows what's in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now you're going to have to read that a few times. Ask the Lord to help you with that perhaps, but the Holy Spirit, we're told here, is our helper. He is a paraclete. He is one that comes alongside. He bears the burdens. Remember Jesus said, when I ascend, I will send another. I will send a helper who comes alongside. The Spirit helps us. The Spirit also intercedes for us. An intercessor is someone who pleads another's case. And by the way, Jesus Christ is our intercessor. He always lives to make intercession for us before the throne of God when we accuse ourselves or Satan accuses us of our sin and not being worthy of being a child of God. Christ is our advocate. He's our intercessor. And do you know that if Christ was not interceding for us, we would fail at this very moment. If he were to stop being our great high priest, who helps us in our weakness, who was in his earthly life weak like us and tempted in all ways, yet without sin. He was able to go to the cross, perfectly accomplish redemption for us. We are redeemed. We are adopted into God's family. We are headed to glory. Our bodies are groaning for that day. We cannot wait to be released from this captivity to sin and corruption in the world. And we're going to glory. And Christ is continuing to make intercession for us at the right hand of the Father. But not only Christ, the Spirit of Christ is doing the same for us. Us even now. It's very encouraging. In fact, that's what Paul is driving at in Romans 8. It is the encouragement and the comfort of this Holy Spirit in our lives. So, if you get asked to pray in a public service, you get asked to pray over a meal, you get asked to pray in a Bible, whatever, just talk to God and pray. And do so as if you understand that the Holy Spirit is making intercession before you. He pleads our case. The Spirit pleads our case before the Father when we don't know how to plead our own. The Spirit intercedes in ways that are beyond human comprehension with groanings too difficult for words. Again, I understand there's some difficulty in this text, but it seems like the Holy Spirit unites with our spirit. The Holy Spirit in us unites with us in our desires to be long from this corruption of this world and the corruption of our earthly bodies and to be with God forever. That's the longing of our hearts. Whether you know it or not, and you do know this, you long to be perfected with God. That's the reason you were saved. 
That's the reason you exist, to glorify God and enjoy Him. Not, not, not just now, but forever. And the Holy Spirit is interceding. Christ is interceding with us, for us, all the time. The Spirit takes up our knees at our deepest emotional level and conveys our hurts and cares to the Father's throne, all in line with the will of God. You have been through difficult times. You know people who have been through difficult times. You do not always know how to pray in those moments, but the Holy Spirit prays for you. It's amazing. This should encourage us to do one thing. Simply pour our hearts out before the Lord. In all our sufferings. In all our difficulties. Not just in Thanksgiving. Not just in the difficult times. Always being totally dependent upon the Lord. And He who searches the heart, that is God. God searches our hearts. And verse 27 says, He knows what's in the mind of the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit is God. And God searches the hearts of men and he knows the mind of the Spirit and the Father understands exactly what the Spirit is thinking because the Spirit intercedes for us and God and the Spirit are on perfect accord. Unbelievable. It's, it's hard to comprehend. It's incomprehensible. One pastor wrote, Every prayer that the Spirit renders up through your groanings is in perfect accordance with the will of God Almighty just like the intercession of our Lord Jesus Christ, wherein he says, not my will, but your will be done. Remember Christ in the garden? Uh, I can't, I'm kind of excited to study that for Good Friday because I think about Christ who's praying, hey, Father, you know, knowing that he's going to the cross three hours before he goes to the cross. If there's any other way, remove this cup from me. Remove this cup of wrath that I'm about to endure. But yet, not thy will, not my will, thy will be done. It is pretty amazing. The pastor goes on to say, every groan, every sigh, every moan, every unuttered and unutterable expression, every word that gets stuck in your throat and cannot come out, Spirit makes it to be as acceptable and understandable as the intercession of our perfect mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing that you can articulate in prayer that God doesn't fully understand because of the Holy Spirit. He understands. That is amazing to think about. Who are the weak? We are the weak. We are all weak and frail, living in these earthly bodies, awaiting our redemption. What is our weakness? <laughs> there are many. Our weaknesses are many. But we just do not know how to pray as we ought. We need to be strong in the battle, strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Well, how are we helped? It's the good news of the gospel. Christ intercedes for us. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. The Holy Spirit empowers us to fight against sin and temptation. The Spirit renews our minds through the Scripture. And the Spirit interprets the deepest longings of our hearts as we seek to pray. Now, I don't want to submit to you that I have a perfect theology of prayer. As one author said, it's much better uh, to just simply pray than to read books about prayer. You want to know what I'm better at? Reading books on prayer than actually praying. That's pretty sad sometimes. But I have to ask myself, and I wonder if this is true, and I'm sure some of you will maybe come up to me after. I wonder if there's times where I'm not articulating with words the longings of my heart. I just really, it's just in me as I'm going through life. I'm grieved at the sight of something we see in the culture, or I'm burdened for someone that comes to mind, or I'm just burdened over my own sin, which is normally the case, or my desire to be better, to be perfected, to be with Christ. What, whatever those things are, it's like I, I, I want to be released. I wonder, I do think the Lord hears those prayers. Unarticulated prayers. You ever have those? You may not say it, but it's in your heart. He knows the longings of your heart because the Spirit lives in us. And He knows the mind of the Spirit. You think about that. You can ponder that. Whether we have the right words to say or not, we can be encouraged that the Spirit of Christ intercedes for us before the Father. Believers should take tremendous encouragement that God's will is being fulfilled 
in their lives, despite their weaknesses and despite their inabilities to know what to pray for. God's will is not frustrated by our weak prayers. <laughs> right? God is at work in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. And as you take that away, and as you continue to read through the rest of Romans, you can see how this would fit nicely with verse 28, which says, For all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purposes. Can you see how all things work together good? Because the Spirit is interceding, because Christ is interceding, and it's all in accordance with God's perfect will. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this look into, the, into your word. We thank you for the Spirit-inspired word, empowered word. I pray, Father, that we would all take this text and we would meditate on it, and you would apply these truths to our hearts so that we bear much fruit. And I would pray, Father, that you would give us an increased prayer life, a full, rich prayer life, always depending on the Spirit to take those prayers before your throne knowing that your will is to be done. Father, help us in our weakness, for we truly are desperate people. But we thank you for the comfort and the encouragement of the Spirit. And Father, we thank you that we have a great intercessor in Jesus Christ, whoever lives to make intercession before us, constantly pleading our case before you, so that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ whose name I pray. Amen. Thank you for your presence. We're dismissed.